is making headlines this hour. President Park Geun-hye unveils a new vision for unification with North Korea in a speech in the former East German city of Dresden. UN Security Council condemns North Korea's recent ballistic missile launch, calling it a violation of UN resolutions, and says it is considering an appropriate response. Plus, Korea's industrial output dipped for the second month in a row in February, fanning fears of a slowing economic recovery. These stories and more next on Arirang News at 8. Good evening to our viewers in Korea and hello to those of you who are watching from around the world. It's Friday, March 28th here in Seoul. I am Yu ji -hye. We begin this evening in Dresden, Germany, where President Park Geun-hye has just wrapped up her speech that was closely watched amid expectations that she would unveil a new vision for a unified Korea. Our correspondent Chi Yusan has more on a package of proposals laid out by the president detailing how the two Koreas should work toward unification. Speaking after receiving an honorary degree from Dresden University of Technology Friday, President Park Geun-hye put forth a three-point proposal for the two Koreas to lay the groundwork for a peaceful reunification. She first highlighted the urgency of allowing thousands of Koreans on both sides of the border see the family members they've been separated from for more than six decades now. President Park then suggested the two Koreas cooperate to boost the North's agricultural production and transportation and communication infrastructures. She also talked about joining hands with China and Russia in railway and distribution projects to promote co-prosperity in Northeast Asia. Next on the president's agenda was increasing people exchanges between the South and the North in the form of historical research, culture, arts and sports. 남북한 간 진정한 소통과 통합을 위해서는 가치관과 사고 방식의 차이를 줄여야 합니다. For all that to happen, the president said, North Korea must give up its nuclear arms and start looking after the lives of its own people. Having learned more about Germany's own reunification experience over the last four days, the South Korean president said she looks forward to a day when young people from Korea, Germany and the world freely visit each other and build a shared future. Before wrapping up her European trip, President Buck travels to Frankfurt to meet with Korea's miners and nurses who were sent to Germany to find jobs and earn foreign currency during her father's presidency in the 1960s and 70s. Choi Yusan, Arirang News, Dresden. President Park has certainly made the most of her state visit to Germany and not only unveiling her vision for unification with North Korea, but also learning from the German experience. Our Kwon Soa has more on what experts think Korea can learn from the German case and what challenges remain. Similar in many ways, but different in others. For a long time, the case of Germany's unification has been seen as a possible model for unification on the Korean peninsula. However, the biggest difference between Korea and Germany is the difference between South and North Korea. While East Germans were practically crying out for unification, South and North Koreans are divided on the issue. Analysts say building trust among the North Korean and South Korean people will play a big role in laying the groundwork for a successful unification. East Germans have chosen to become one with West Germany. The North Korean people need to trust South Korea and choose to be united. Experts say the gap in cultural and lifestyle differences between the two Koreas must be narrowed, but without pressing the North Korean people to change. They also say South Koreans need to be convinced that unification will enhance Korea's image, attract foreign investment and eventually make for a stronger economy. Although it's widely understood that the two Koreas will not become one overnight, like in Germany's case, there are lessons to be learned. While Germany did not have a precise plan for unification, they did prepare in the strongest way. They achieved it through clean politics and a transparent civil society, and also matured into a world economic leader. That's why they could absorb the sudden shock of unification well. 
The North would especially gain a great deal through reunification due to its weak economy and impoverished people. Despite the constant provocations, such as the recent missile tests, experts say North Korea is interested in reunification. It just doesn't want to play second fiddle to the South during the process. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. In a show of improved three-way ties between South Korea, U.S. and Japan, the three nations are set to hold defense talks next month in Washington, D.C. The move follows the trilateral summit held in the Netherlands earlier this week, in which they reaffirmed the importance of a united stand against North Korea's nuclear program. Our Shin Se-min reports. South Korea and Japan may not share the same understanding of history, but one thing they do have in common is a desire to keep the peace in Northeast Asia. Seoul's defense ministry said Friday that South Korea, Japan and the U.S. will hold defense trilateral talks on April 17th and 18th. They will include the deputy defense ministers from the three nations and represent the sixth such talk since 2008. The official says discussions will center on strengthening cooperation against North Korea's nuclear threat and the possible restart of six-party talks. The nuclear program will also be a point of emphasis when the top nuclear negotiators from South Korea, the U.S. and Japan sit down for talks soon. The discussions will center on strengthening cooperation against North Korea's nuclear threat and the possible restart of six-party talks. No details on when and where they'll take place have been announced. Both the defense talks and the future meeting between nuclear negotiators were proposed earlier this week when the leaders of three countries met on the sidelines of the nuclear security summit in The Hague. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The U.N. Security Council has unanimously condemned North Korea's recent ballistic missile launches. It called them a clear violation of existing resolutions and said it will continue discussions and appropriate response. Her Kim Hyun-bin has more. The U.N. Security Council has spoken with one voice on North Korea's launch of two mid-range ballistic missiles earlier this week, expressing deep concern after a closed-door meeting on Thursday. The 15-nation council said it would hold consultations and respond appropriately to Pyongyang's latest provocation. The council's president, Luxembourg's U.N. ambassador, Sophie Lucas, said it was a clear violation of Security Council resolutions, despite concerns that they wouldn't. North Korea's biggest ally, China, supported the statement, but only to a point. Experts say it's unlikely Beijing will give its backing to additional economic sanctions on the North. In 2006 and 2009, the Security Council slapped three sanctions, banning the North from launching any type of missile that has ballistic capabilities. They followed North Korea's first and second nuclear tests. The Security Council expanded sanctions after another nuclear test in February of last year. North Korea fired two medium-range Nodong ballistic missiles into the East Sea in the early hours of Wednesday morning, Korea time. It was the first such mid-range missile launch since 2009. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. The Korea struck a deal on Friday to sell 12 F-50 fighter jets to the Philippines for 420 million U.S. dollars. Under the terms of the government-to-government -government deal, Korea Aerospace Industries will deliver the jets the most advanced variant of the T-50 Golden Eagle supersonic trainer to Manila in the next 38 months. The F-A-50 is co-developed by KAI and U.S. defense firm Lockheed Martin. The outbound shipment follows similar contracts with Iraq last year and Indonesia in 2011. Korea also has its side on selling the F-A-50 to Peru, Botswana and the UAE. The contract comes after the presidents of Korea and the Philippines signed a Memorandum of Understanding on Expanding Defense Cooperation in October. For the latest in news that impacts Korea and the world, join Yu Ji Hae for a lively half hour that covers politics, business, international news, and much more. Live at 8 every weeknight on Adirang TV. Korea's industrial output dropped in February for the second straight month, while the business sentiment of Korean manufacturers also remained weak. This has raised concerns that the domestic economy is not on track to a strong recovery. Hwang Ji-hae has the details. 
Korea's economic conditions might not be improving as quickly as many had hoped. Statistics Korea said Friday that the nation's industrial output shrank 1.8 percent last month from January, marking the second straight month of decline. The agency attributed the drop in output to slowing production in the nation's auto sector, which fell more than 7 percent in February on month. It cited fewer exports of Korean automobiles to the United States due to the harsh winter there and consumers waiting for the scheduled release of new models. The agency added that the decline is most likely temporary because the output numbers from January to February improved from the fourth quarter last year. Experts, however, remain dubious about the strength of the recovery this year. They say the domestic economy faces an uphill battle in trying to maintain the pace of recovery seen in the second half of last year. If the economic growth rate reaches 1 percent every quarter this year from a quarter earlier, like the second half of 2013, the economy will be able to expand over 4 percent this year. But for now, that remains questionable. The Bank of Korea data also showed that business sentiment among Korean manufacturers remained weak last month. Although the index reached 81, up from 78 in February, the reading is still below the benchmark 100, which means there are more pessimists than optimists. The central bank expects the Korean economy to grow 3.8 percent this year after a 3 percent growth last year. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Thirty years ago this Friday, the very first mobile communication device was introduced in Korea. From car phones and pagers to cell phones and then smartphones, the rapid pace of developments over the years has been remarkable. As Sun Jung-in walks us down memory lane starting in 1984. Mobile phones have come a long way over the last 30 years in Korea, and it all started with the car phone. Despite it costing a whopping $3,700 in 1984, which back then was almost as expensive as the car itself, car phones created a buzz among the wealthy, and the number of subscribers had surpassed 2,000 just one month after being released. The phone was very big, and many people were curious and asked if they could touch it or use it. Then in 1986, the beeper, or as it's known in Korea, the beepi, came around. It was the nation's very first portable mobile device. It soon caught on and carrying a pager on your belt became a fashion trend. Then in 1988, Seoul hosted the Summer Olympic Games, the same year that mobile phone services were first introduced. The phones, which were as big as bricks, launched the era of Korea's mobile communication industry. Eight years later, the world's first CDMA-based digital cellular service began in 1996, which was a stepping stone for the wireless technology to expand its territory. The number of cell phone users surged to over 10 million in just three years. Korea easily adapted to the mobile devices, which changed people's daily activities and the productivity at companies. Korea was once considered a wasteland for mobile communications, lagging 40 years behind the United States. But today, the nation is widely acknowledged as a world leader in the IT industry. Sun Jung-in, Arirang News. The 12th annual Tongyang International Music Festival kicked off Friday evening in the southern coastal city of Tongyang. Under the theme Seascapes, the festival will present various performances by established and up-and-coming artists. This year's festival celebrates in particular the opening of a new seaside concert hall, which took more than three years to complete. The venue is expected to give new wings to the festival that started 13 years ago in memory of world-famous Korean composer and Tongyang young native Yuni Sang. The festival runs through April 3rd. It's time for In the Press, where we look at some of the issues that have captured the attention of the domestic media this week. From how the sinking of a South Korean warship, Chonan, four years ago is viewed by students in the nation to a Hollywood blockbuster that will start filming here in Seoul this weekend. We go over now to our Yudian for more. Leon. 
Good evening and happy Friday. Let's go straight to the Tonga Ilbo, which did a feature story uh, marking this week's four year anniversary of the sinking of the South Korean warship Cheonan that left 46 sailors dead back in 2010. Now, the headline up here reads 63% of elementary school students say, I don't know about Cheonan warship. So, Tonga Ilbo looked into how aware South Korean students are of the incident that rocked the nation just four years ago. Let's take a Look a closer look at this chart on the very far left. Uh, the small portion highlighted in bright blue on the very far left shows how only a small number of elementary, middle, and high school students are fully aware of the incident. The rest only know of the incident or have never even heard of it. Now, the same survey also showed that at least a quarter of all students doubt the South Korean government's claim that North Korea was responsible for the attack. As you may, as you may remember, Seoul has put the blame on North Korea for the sinking, but Pyongyang continues to deny any involvement. Now, it's one thing to be unaware and unsure of the details, but another to be completely unaware of the incident itself which happened just four years ago. Now let's take a look at this next article from Joseon Ilbo. The headline down here reads, Chinese companies copy Korean products in six months, leaving Korean companies deeply troubled. Now take a look at the photo up here. Uh, you see three air conditioners on the left that were unveiled at the Consumer Electronics Show back in January by a Chinese company called Hire. Now the three on the right with almost the exact same design are air conditioners by Korea's LG Electronics electronics that were unveiled at the same show two years ago. And here again on the right, you can see that both TVs have a unique design that resembles an artist's easel. The one on the left is from Chinese electronics company TCL, and the one on the right by Samsung Electronics was unveiled eight months earlier at the IFA, Europe's biggest tech show. Now, the article says because of this infringement by Chinese companies, domestic companies are strengthening security over their products at these shows, and some are even reconsidering whether they should bring out their latest and most advanced technologies to these shows. Let's take a look at this next article. Now, part of the major Hollywood blockbuster, The Avengers 2, will be filmed here in Seoul starting this weekend. Now, this article from Chungang Ilbo offers more detail, and the headline up here reads, Avengers 2 shooting on 30th, that's March 30th, of course, and Mapo Grand Bridge blocked off entirely for 11 hours. Now, the photo on the very far left shows the shutdown of the Mapo Grand Bridge in a form of a map, and and this is raising some eyebrows. As an essential bridge that connects the southern and northern parts of Seoul, the Mapo Grand Bridge was never closed off even for major international events like the 1988 Seoul Olympics or the Seoul International Marathon. Now, about 20 minutes of the movie, a movie will be full filmed here in Seoul, and this is considered a big deal as it's the first time a Hollywood blockbuster is being shot here in Korea. Now, some film industry personnel, according to the article, even uh, have hopes that the Avengers 2 will make the Mapo Grand Bridge a hot go-to place in Korea, much like the movie Spider-Man did for New York City's Brooklyn Bridge. Now, with that, I'll wrap up this week's lick at the stories in the Korean press. Let's check on some of the stories making headlines on the global front. From strong words out of UN on Russia to Turkey pulling the plug on YouTube, we go live to Paul Lee at the News Center. Paul, let's start with the crisis in Ukraine. Though the international community is tightening the vice on Russia over its annexation of Crimea, the United Nations, United States and the International Monetary Fund are coming to the aid of Ukraine while lobbying fresh sanctions towards Moscow. Our Kim ji reports. The United Nations has thrown its support behind Ukraine and further isolated Russia from the international community for its actions in Crimea. The General Assembly approved a non-binding resolution that affirms Ukraine's territorial integrity and called the referendum for Crimea succession illegal. 100 member countries voted in favor of the resolution, with 11 voting against, 58 abstaining and 24 absent. 
The United States is applying pressure to Russia while supporting Ukraine. U.S. Congress is promoting bills that would provide $1 billion in loan guarantees to Ukraine and $150 million in direct assistance. The House of Representatives is expected to approve the legislation Friday in Washington, which the Senate passed the day before with bipartisan support. The legislation is known to include more senior Russian officials and corporations that will be subject to asset freezes and travel bans. The U.S.-based Visa and MasterCard companies halted transactions for Bank Russia after it was placed under the sanctions list. In response, Russian President Vladimir Putin stressed the need for Russia to develop its own payment network. Meanwhile, the International Monetary Fund is rushing to help Ukraine. The IMF approved a two-year loan of up to 18 billion U.S. dollars for the nation, which is on the verge of default. Analysts say Ukraine's state liability has risen to nearly 13 billion dollars this year alone. In return, Kiev promised to undertake economic and energy reforms. Russia has cut off 15 billion dollars in aid to Ukraine since the ousting of former President Viktor Yanukovych. A top Ukrainian defense official, Andriy Paruvi, said in a webcast from Kiev that nearly 100,000 Russian forces are stationed on the eastern borders of Ukraine, near the cities of Kharkiv and Donetsk. Kim Jion, Arirang News. And Paul, moving on to the latest surrounding missing Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, there's been a major shift in the search for wreckage. What can you tell us? Well, no confirmed pieces of the plane have been found yet, but authorities say progress is being made. Australian authorities said Friday that they have abandoned a previous search area in the southern Indian Ocean in favor of a new site more than 1,100 kilometers to the northeast. They say the decision was based on updated advice from the air crash investigation team in Malaysia. This continuing analysis indicates the plane was traveling faster than was previously estimated resulting in increased fuel usage and reducing the possible distance it travelled south into the Indian Ocean. Ten additional aircraft and six ships have been redirected to the new area, which spans some 320,000 square kilometres. Satellites will also be repositioned towards the fresh coordinates. And turning to the Philippines, we hear a landmark peace deal has been signed between the government and the Muslim rebel group. Paul, what can you expect from the two sides moving forward? The peace agreement was sealed on Thursday, hopefully signaling an end to nearly 45 years of brutal conflict that has killed more than 120,000 people. Under the pact, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front will disband their guerrilla forces and surrender weapons, while the government will give them greater autonomy over economic and cultural affairs. So many people have suffered for so long. So many of our stakeholders have worked so hard to arrive at this point. I will not let peace be snatched from my people again. Not now. Not now, when we have already undertaken the most difficult and most significant steps to achieve it. Negotiations on the peace accord began in 2001. The deal paves the way for an expansion of the autonomous region on the southern island of Mindanao, home to most of the country's five million Muslims. And Paul, before we let you go, let's focus on Turkey, where the government has taken steps to block access to YouTube. What's behind this action against social media? The Turkish Prime Minister's office says the move to block YouTube was a precaution to protect national security after voice recordings were posted online, purportedly of senior officials discussing possible military operations in Syria. Prime Minister Tayyip Erdogan appeared to have confirmed the audio leak as he called it villainous and dishonest during a rally Thursday. But experts say it will do little to silence the voice of the people. Ultimately, people will take to the streets if they don't have communication channels. If they block YouTube and Twitter, they'll go to other channels. People will create their own blogs. They'll text message. If they block those networks, people will take to the streets. So you can't really hold people down for too long. The ban on YouTube comes a week after Turkish authorities blocked access to the microblogging website Twitter. The crackdown also comes just days before nationwide municipal elections open on Sunday. GA? All right, Paul, thank you very much for that update. We'll see you back in about two hours' time.
And time to get a check on the forecast with our Kim Bogyong at the Weather Center. The Bogyong afternoon highs in Seoul today rose to the mid 20s, but it came along with the high levels of fine dust. That's right, Jia. Yeah. 24 degrees is the highest temperature recorded in March. And as for the fine dust, the pre fine dust warning has now been lifted. While Jeju will gradually be under the influence of a low pressure trough, which is why some places in Jeju are seeing sporadic showers at this hour. In fact, a pre heavy rainfall watch has been issued there. And the mountains of Jeju may get over 100 millimeters of precipitation through late tomorrow night. The showers will spread to the southern regions by early tomorrow morning and reach the central regions in the morning. Some good news that the rain will wash away the fine dust. Other than that, Sunday looks to be a sunny one in most parts of the country. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul, Daegu, and Gwangju hit the high teens while Busan peaks at 15. Moving on to other regions, Daejeon and Jeju reach the high teens when Dokdo tops out at 30. Team. Back to you, Jihae. All right, and that brings us to the end of our newscast. I'm Yu Jihae in Seoul. I'll be back with more news updates in our primetime news at 10 p.m. Korea time. See you then.